Come on in. If you want, you can take this third row for me. You've got the first two, okay? Guys, 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 guys. remain seated at all times while the vehicle is in motion. When we come to a complete stop, you can feel free to stand up, get a better look at the animals, or take a photo. In the event of a medical emergency, if you're in the last two cars, you can press the yellow strip above your head that will send me a signal that you need my assistance. If you're in the car directly behind me, tap on the glass or get my attention by waving at me in the rear view mirror. Please hold on to all of your personal belongings. If you drop an item off the tram during the tour, I cannot stop to pick it up but if you make a mental note of where you dropped it and let me know when you get back to the station, we will go out and attempt to retrieve it for you. During our time together, we will identify some physiological characteristics and behaviors that wildlife have to survive in their natural habitat. Now, over on the left-hand side of on my hill, I want to point this out because she might be gone when we come back. That is Maria, that little southern white rhino right there up on the green with her mom. That is Kianga, and Kumaria is the baby. She's about four months old. Super cute little girl. A little southern white rhino. Southern white rhinos are the most social species of rhino, and they're also the largest. Southern white rhinos reach about 5,000 pounds and about six feet tall at the shoulder. So Kumaria's mom is about 5,000 pounds. Here is some more southern white rhinos over on the left hand side. Up on the green hill grazing. They are grazers. They have a white flat mouth that makes them perfectly designed for grazing and grasses. They're actually called the uh, lawnmower of the savannah. Lawnmower of the savannah. So we have four southern white rhinos right there and we've got two more over here on this other hill on the left hand side. Over on the right hand side we have our flamboyant of greater flamingo. There's a lot of flamingo. Now they might have lighter colored feathers you would expect this is because of where they live. They live in the salt marshes of Africa where it's super hot. The lighter colored feathers help them to deflect heat and regulate their body temperature. And over on the left, we have those southern white rhinos that they're grazing. Now, I mentioned that they were social. They're the most social species of rhino. The females actually require other females to be around in order for them to go into estrus and breed with a male. They are the only species that have that behavior. In fact, they tend to live in a herd together with other females called crashes. Now they don't have very good eyesight, but they've got an excellent sense of hearing and smell. So they may not see us, but they know that we're here. Those ears are like little satellite dishes. They will point them in the direction that they want to pay attention to. Thank you guys so much for visiting us here today at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. By coming through one of the two front doors of the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, you enable us to continue our conservation efforts around the world. And now we're our mission to help create a world where all life can thrive. This makes you an ally for wildlife. 
Outstanding of the Wildlife Alliance focuses their conservation efforts primarily on game conservation of the around the world. And we're going to visit two of those today. One is the African Savannah, the other is the Southwest Hub, which is located right here in San Diego County. Now over on the right hand side we have yet more southern white rhinos. We have had a very successful breeding program. So we have several southern white, white rhinos here at the Safari Park. The uh, Safari Park is actually a breeding facility after all and it opened to the public in 1972. Now these uh, southern white rhinos here at the Nikita Khan Rhino Rescue Center play a very important role in trying to save the northern white rhino from going extinct. Does anybody know how many northern white rhinos are left on the planet? She was correct, there's only two. There's a, a mother and daughter living in Kenya under 24-hour guard. Now since they're both female, they are functionally extinct. But we've had two successful births seven white rhino calves through, in the, uh, um, through uh, artificial insemination and we hope to be able to use the southern white rhino as a surrogate uh, using in vitro fertilization. We've got uh, northern white rhino genetic material in our frozen zoo that we hope that we can use to um, increase the population of northern white rhinos in the world. Save them from going completely extinct. Now, all rhino species are at risk for uh, illegal poaching to their horns. Some cultures believe that the horn has medicinal value, which is not true. If you kill your own hair and your own fingernails, that's the same material that horn is made of. It would be protein called keratin. These deer up here on the right-hand side, that's just local wildlife. These are mule deer. They live inside and outside the park. And we don't mind them living here. They feel safe here and there's plenty to eat. Now over on the left hand side, we have two different species of pelican. We've got the Dalmatian pelican and a great white pelican. The Dalmatian is the largest species of pelican and the one with the gray on its wings. Both species of pelican have what is called a gular patch attached to their lower jaw. They use it to capture fish and swallow it whole. It also does double duty as a method of regulating their body temperature when they do something called gular fluttering. It looks like they're panting. They're actually cooling down their body temperature. So it's similar to how your dog might uh, pant. We sometimes call that their internal air conditioner. This is the same mechanism, the same premise. You guys can say wonderful day to come to the park today. It's great weather. It's nice and cold in the morning. The animals are the most active in the morning and evening when it is cool. And during the day, they are typically going to be resting and conserving their energy. Unless they have to sleep for predators, which is not too common here at the park. The wildlife here are pretty spoiled, and many of them are endangered species, so we work hard to increase their numbers many times, but we're really set back in the wild to increase the population in their native habitat. Two examples I can give you of releasing animals back into the wild would be the uh, burrowing owl and the, the California condor. Now over on the right hand side, we see the super bird marsh. We have several different species of bird in here. We have those uh, sacred ibis. They are the ones with the white body, the black tail, and the black head with the long curved black beak. That's the sacred ibis. Now that beak is perfectly designed for uh, searching for prey and medicine sand. They actually don't see it, they feel it with that specific beak, and that's how they capture it. Laying there close together, there's some yellow-billed storks. They're the ones with the yellow bills and the red around their eyes. There's two of them right next to each other right there. Yellow-billed storks. Have the 
tan back, the white belly, and the beautiful uh, markings on their face. It's not just pretty eye makeup. That is called a threat mask. It is a uh, physiological characteristic that you will see carried over to other species of antelope that we will encounter today. It does a couple of things. It uh, helps hide their eyes, so if they are in an altercation, it, uh, the sensitive part of their body is not as easily seen, so it also elongates their horns, makes them look a little more intimidating to a potential predator. So when you're small and cute like the Sombrink Savelle, you will take all you, you will take all you can get to look more intimidating and larger, because the larger you are and the more intimidating you look, the less predator problems you're going to have. That tan back helps them to uh, camouflage in their native desert environment. Females do not have horns, so they don't have to compete for resources. 
Now over there on the right hand side, those are Somali wild ass. They've got that lavender back and the white belly and those markings on their legs are called, uh, that's their quality mark. And those are actually unique to each individual. So they, when they migrate from one place to the other, they will be grazing like you see uh, the one closest to us doing now. They can just glance up and make sure that they haven't been separated from the herd. Similar to the Elixir waterback because nobody wants to be separated from the herd. That gorgeous lavender coat helps them to blend in best at dust and dawn. And the white belly deflects heat and helps them regulate their body temperature. This is one of the most endangered species here at the park. There's only a few hundred individuals left in their uh, native habitat. This is due to drought, famine, and civil war. And over on the left hand side, these are the thigh giraffe. The tallest species of giraffe, the male, at the furthest end here the, with the dark spot. He uh, is about 18 feet tall. And the rule of thumb for the tongue is one inch of tongue for one foot of height. So this tongue is about 18 inches long. Now giraffes have what is called a prehensile tongue. If you take your index finger and you curl it around like this, like I'm doing, that is how their tongue works. It, they can wrap it around a branch and flip it over its leaves. Giraffe are uniquely designed to take advantage of these food source that is up higher than other host mammals can reach. Now those two lavender colored antelope with those long straight horns, those are South African oryx or Gimsbok. One of my favorites. I love the lavender coat and the black and white markings. Those long straight horns are about three feet long. Now as we go up the hill here, I'm not going to stop and keep your eyes directed towards the left hand side for more wildlife in this Central Africa enclosure. Stripe and the spots, the white spots, that is a bit of tongue. 
cute little orange creature with the white marking. Now over on the right hand side, this is called Coastal Space Scrub. This is one of the most endangered ecosystems in the United States, with only about 15% left in the state of California. The Safari Park is about 1,800 acres, and about half of that is dedicated to preserving this endangered habit habitat for the uh, local wildlife, like those mule deer that we saw. Now there's another view of those eastern black rhinos down there, and the uh, male herd of roan antelope is closest to us, laying on the green grass right there. That's the bachelor herd of roan antelope. And the one that's walking down the hill, that eastern black rhino, that is the male. His name is Kindy. Zebra are unique to each individual, so they can identify each other by those striping patterns. A herd of zebra together is called a dazzle, perhaps because it would be very confusing to a predator when they encounter a um, herd of zebra like that. They can't pick one individual out of the herd. So those striping patterns allow them to blend in or camouflage, just like one big zebra. It gives them a safety in numbers. Safety in numbers. It is the individuals that wander off by themselves and get picked off by a predator. Down there on the left hand side, 
Strike, Frank Fox, If you are interested in learning more about the efforts to save the northern white rhino from the brink of extinction, I would encourage you to take a behind the scenes tour of the Nikita Khan Rhino Rescue Center. It is super educational and really entertaining.
waiting for a shuttle? Any shuttle bus. There's a party of two at home in the neighborhood. You can drive us to the uh, exit. When I get done with the exit.